Yeah, so I can go ahead and get going. So welcome everyone who's here. This is one of the educational sessions of the DIFF Hackathon 2024. This is an introduction to decentralized identity. Um, if you're new uh, to the concepts or if you just have any questions, um, the session will be led by Andor Kesselman. He's co-chair of the technical steering committee here at DIFF, also CTO and engineering consultant at Andor Labs. And then we have Anchor Banerjee who is also co-chair, uh, another of our co-chairs on the DIFF Technical Steering Committee, um, who is a uh, co-founder and CTO of Checked. Um, so with that, I'll hand it off to Andor and Anchor. Awesome. And uh, those of you that didn't see, Checked is doing one of the, the hackathon projects this year. So hopefully you get uh, involved with that. Um, awesome stuff. And so we'll be switching off and on um, between Encore and myself, uh, and we'll just get going here. But we'll talk a little bit about why decentralized identity in the first place, and we'll share a little bit of our personal stories to think about what got us into the space. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about the building blocks of decentralized identity. You might see Kim here as well. Kim, you're always welcome to to pin if you have any uh, thoughts here. Uh, Kim obviously is also executive director of Diff and very familiar with uh, a lot of these concepts. And then I think we'll explore some hackathon projects and, and do some fun stuff after this. So give you guys some basics uh, on, on the basic building blocks, some concept overviews, and then we, we kind of move on to actual real stuff. Um, so I'll start with me and then we're gonna go next and talk about how we got into decentralized identity. Why are we solving decentralized identity problems? So my wife's Indian um, and we got married during COVID. And uh, when we got married, the borders were blocked and my family wasn't able to visit for my or visit my wife. So we were married for three years and we looked and this is a very strenuous process. Like bureaucracy was really slow. Documents took months or years to get processed um, on each step. So, and they'd ask these basic questions like how much money do you make? Uh, what's your assets? Where do you live? And so for me, decentralized identity was this way of moving data faster across ecosystems to solve some of these problems around uh, data uh, sort of uh, motion and, and, and privacy related to visa processes. So that's that's the problem it solved for me. Um, and there's a lot of other use cases, but these are real use cases that you can apply that are impacting real people. And um, yeah, if anybody has any questions on this, I'm happy to answer. Um, that, that picture is from my wedding, actually. Um, but uh, we, we the idea here is decentralized identity might be able to move this process that took three years down to or shorter, right? Um, and that's kind of where decentralized identity is fairly powerful. Um, and then Encore, you wanna go ahead? Yeah, absolutely. So the first uh, decentralized ID project that I got involved in was one for the UN High Commission for Refugees. This was back when I was working at a global consultancy um, and I was working primarily on traditional digital ID systems at that time. The, the kinds of uh, digital ID systems that you might use for biometric verification with your bank so that they can figure out if you're a fraudster or not, um, or the kinds of systems that you might encounter at airports and that check your passports. Um, but I got involved with this project because the problem statement here was um, as the refugees during the Syrian refugee crisis at the time in Europe were moving across from country to country, and you might have experienced this yourself if you've moved cities, moved states, moved, moved different regions. You often end up having to register with 25 plus different agencies or bodies every time you move. Um, that might be things like a doctor, a local school, a local sort of like, you know, council, national council, et cetera, et cetera, which can be quite cumbersome to, to manage. Um, and I think especially within Europe because of historical reasons. Uh, people weren't really keen on creating one single giant centralized database with everyone's records. Um, and so the, the problem statement was how could this be done without having like a giant IT project, sort of like in a giant database of vulnerable people. And where the UN High Commission for Refugees settled on this, is by giving people themselves a copy of uh, their identity that they can use digitally. 
And bearing in mind over here that they might have actually lost their actual passport, actual driver's license or other, other paper or plastic traditional forms of ID. And because they're refugees, they didn't actually have recourse to go and ask their government to say, hey, um, reissue me that piece of identity, please. And so that that was back in 2017, 2016, I think. Um, and it's been a journey since then to be working across a lot of different governments and non-governmental projects on decentralized identity. And for the past few years, been building a, uh, that sort of like network at Chet. Any any questions on these use cases? And this is awesome, Encore. Any questions on for Encore or myself before we continue on? about why we got into the space and why we think these problems are, are worth solving. Let's see. Oh, <laughs> yeah. A question. There we go. Um, yeah, we are matching. That's funny. Um, all right, we'll continue on. Um, uh, you want to take this one? Yes. So uh, maybe to get started on the, uh, like, you know, the concept of what is identity, um, there's, there's a very common or famous saying like within the digital ID space if this is one of your first uh, and the saying goes like on the internet nobody knows you're a dog you might have experienced a form of this if you've been on any kind of online forum or social media website um, you get to represent yourself entirely using pseudonymous handles um, or you don't actually have to reveal your real identity um, and that can be good or bad. Like, you know, it allows people to have a level of anonymity when they speak, which, which can have good effects and bad effects. And it comes from this particular cartoon in the New Yorker, if you go to the next slide, um, which this is the original cartoon that inspired it. The previous picture with the actual dog was at a Facebook conference when they launched Login with Facebook. Um, so yeah, like what we'll give you a flavor of is what is decentralized identity and to maybe, uh, get started, I think, and, or I think the next slide is yep. yours. Yep. So, got some uh, yeah, so you just heard two use cases. I was looking at actually both of them very similar in terms of like immigration and moving across countries. Um, but it's not just immigration that decentralized identity impacts us. Um, if you're a nurse or a doctor, um, when you actually go through grad, uh, medical school, you have to go through this verification process. And you may wait months, if not uh, up to a year, to get that final uh, verification flow done. And so that's an incredible amount of loss of income after going through a whole bunch of school. Um, and this is one area where decentralized identity can speed up the process quite a bit. Um, the supply chain fraud is another one where there's a lot of efforts going on today trying to solve some of these supply chain issues that we're seeing. You know, where are assets being created? How does that fit into the picture? Um, and who's fraudulent uh, as entities within the supply chain? So it's a massive opportunity that is currently, you know, big interest in the decentralized identity space. Cyber crimes, if you're an elderly person, for example, um, often there's a lot of scams. So Decentralized identity is a really good starting point for solving some of these uh, cases where people are pretending they're they're an entity they're not, trying to ask for very private information. If, for example, the and the tech can allow this, right? It's not really possible or not really um, e easy to share personal data, like for example your social security number. Um, then it it becomes much harder for these attackers to and acquire this information. But without details of identity, it becomes really easy for people to pretend, oh, I'm this person and I'm doing, you know, these things and please have your security number and forth, especially like certain groups that can be a, a very problematic. And the other thing is when we talk about identity um, and thinking about, you know, where do people trust putting their identity information? Identity is not just your your driver's license. Identity is also your social you post identity is what you tag um, on whatever system you're on. Your emails are your identity. There's actually a lot of things. And when you think about how much power we give to, for example, some of these main uh, centralized systems like uh, Instagram and so forth to own all our followers, Amazon to own our reputation as, as sellers. This is a big problem. And a lot of people don't often trust these larger organizations to hold that much data. So identity is, is not just your driver's license. It's also not limited to just humans. It's IoT, it's software, it's art, um, it's your private chats, it's it's work documents, and anything is basically related to identity. It's just how you apply it. 
And so when you think about the problems you're going to be solving through this hackathon, don't limit yourself to proving this thing is a person. That's one use case, but there's also all these other use cases you could start exploring, and some of them are very, very interesting. Any any questions on this before we move on? We'll talk quickly about this concept of uh, self-sovereign identity. So decentralized identity and self-sovereign identity aren't entirely synonymous. Um, they're slightly different, but self-sovereign identity is a, a term coined by Chris Rallin, um, I don't know what year, but it basically has 10, 10 areas of control for, or 10 areas of, of uh, attributes to think about self-sovereign identity, existence, control, access, transparency, persistence, portability, interoperability, consent, minimization, and protection. So if you, and I'm not gonna go through each of these in detail, um, it would take a lot of time, but if you think about what are the levers you kind of have and the attributes that you want in an identity system, these are sort of very close to them. And so when you're thinking about what are the things and offerings that decentralized identity and, and having more control over my identity can give in terms of a value proposition, it's greater, uh, for example, control over my identifier, better portability, more ability to interoperate with other systems, uh, the ability to reduce my data uh, uh, sharing uh, or minimizing the data uh, uh, that I share with other parties. Those are the things that we have to think about as sort of axioms when we think about this problem space. Uh, Ankur, you want to go? Yes. So um, just why on why is self-sovereign identity important? Um, there's a study behind this. You can look into the methodology and the data. But um, just at a very sort of like, you know, simple level, when you think of the existing digital identity systems for people, for companies, for things. Um, when we when when we sort of like you know, surveyed people about this and looked at um, statements around self-sovereign identity, like you know, a lot of people felt that they have limited or no control on how the data that they share with companies get used. And even if you have something like a consent sort of like in you know, a screen where you say, that uh, yes, like, you know, use it for marketing purposes or analytics purposes, you have limited sort of uh, recourse to after you've given that consent, how does your data get used? And that gets sort of like, you know, reflected in that sentiment around, are the existing data privacy regulations sufficient for giving users control? There are some aspects of them in certain countries like in, or regions like Europe and Canada. But for example, the US still doesn't have a data protection sort of law outside of a couple of different states. And some very other large uh, regions like India don't either. So, you know, you really have to start wondering which part of this can be led by regulation and how much of this can be led sort of like, you know, grounds up by technology. And when looking at the sentiment around what sort of like, you know, formats of identity do people see themselves evolving to, a huge proportion of the respondents to the survey said that self-sovereign identity will become the default in the next sort of like, you know, five years. And I think the survey was conducted last year. Um, and what specifically going on to the next slide do people care about in sort of self-sovereign identity? This shows a distribution. They care about the privacy of their personal or company data. We'll give you some examples of how decentralized identity enables that. They care about the efficiency gains compared to existing methods of proving their identity or reputation online. Um, being able to make the date, their data portable. So this is not just about having a digital copy of your, say, like your driver's license, but even things like, could you move from a platform like Instagram to a competing platform? Um, is your data and your reputation and your graph portable enough to allow that? That's something that is enabled by self-sovereign identity. It is democratic, decentralized, and controlled by the people. Governance is a big part of this as well. It's not just about technology. Um, it's more inclusive than existing systems. It has a level of technological innovation, and there is scope for making um, commercial models as well off the back of it. Just and one, one quick yes. point, I think, is that when Encore is saying inclusive, the interesting part is inclusion also means that you can define your rules. So, you know, there are various decentralized identity approaches and sometimes decentralization means that 
people like if you think about community growths and how they work, sometimes communities are open, sometimes communities are closed. And that's the beautiful part about decentralization. It doesn't force a position around how you want to structure your communities and your data. Um, you know, and Encore being uh, CTO of Checked, um, they do a lot of their stuff using this thing called did link resources. And we'll go to dids in a bit. But that's using a, a reusable sort of um, decentralized identifier approach to handling all of their data. Um, and just you'll see a lot of different approaches. And that's the thing is one of the things I'd encourage you during this hackathon is to when you're not sure and you get overwhelmed, if you do get overwhelmed by the amount of options, just reach out to the community and ask, hey, I'm trying to solve this problem and start with the problem statement first, not the technology because there's probably a few different approaches towards solving that problem uh, with various um, uh, technology backings. Um, so when we look at kind of data models and thinking about the paradigms we're talking about here, decentralized identity, this is mostly in the password uh, sort of uh, paradigm, but there's, there's other things outside of passwords. Um, but when we think about centralized passwords, that's like when you sign up with an e email and uh, username and password uh, on your traditional you know, websites, then you have this thing called uh, federated models, which is using your Facebook, your Googles, your GitHub to log into other sites. The problem with both of these approaches is that it ends up putting a lot of pressure on these larger organizations to maintain the data safely. Um, and and they be basically become what I call a honeypot, right? They basically become this, this area where an attacker has a lot of incentive to break through uh, the these massive databases of data. Um, you know, when we look at, for example, centralized identity systems um, that rely on, for example, Adar, for those of you that are familiar with India, I think they had some workings with the telecom provider and the telecom provider got hacked and millions and millions and millions, if not like some hundreds of millions of records got lost. Like this happens all the time. We see this happen. I think Okta recently was hacked, I think last year. So this is not an unfamiliar story. We've heard a lot of these organizations getting hacked consistently. Um, but when it comes to decentralization, when we think about the paradigm here, uh, it reduces uh, data risk um, from the perspective of there's no single attack point. Um, it's all spread out. And so my data alone is not as valuable as a million people's data. And so all of a sudden the attack surface is just, it's much more spread. And that's a really, from a security standpoint and a privacy standpoint, it means a lot from a uh, uh, being able to say, oh, well, there's not one single source of, of uh, attack to, to basically um, uh, choose as a, as a vector. You can, you can spread this out. And so we, we end up in a little bit more of a secure world um, because it's just it, the cost of, of particularly attacking one particular individual is less, uh, it, the, it doesn't make as much sense um, as with large scale databases and so forth. So federated models, you guys are all probably familiar with this. That's the traditional like login with Google, login with Facebook. You're relying on this third party to manage that identity and use it as an, uh, a way to access a whole bunch of information. And then you become sort of the broker of uh, authorization between the, uh, the, 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 the two. Um, but when we think about self-sovereign identity and we think about decentralized identity, it typically moves to this, this model called the trust triangle. Uh, and we have typically three sort of main actors in this model. Um, we have the issuer, the verifier, and the holder. Um, out of curiosity, before I go into this, who's heard of this model before the trust triangle? And uh, I'm curious to the group, what you guys know about the trust triangle. Um, who's seen it before? Who's, who's this first time seeing it? If you can put it in the chat or comment here, that'd be great. Let's see if anybody's saying anything. Let's see. GB says he saw it back in Open Badges. Open Badges are using Verify Credentials now in Open Badges V3. So that's actually, we'll talk about that actually, because we'll be getting into Verify Credentials, but that's that's awesome. You might, yeah, so there are cases people will have seen it. Um, but the trust triangle is the issuers, uh, for example, you can imagine a government institution, it also be yourself, is somebody that is issuing claims about a particular entity saying this thing is this, right? Um, it can be about basically anything you want, but um, it's the idea is, is that these are cryptographically signed, saying that you know this is a non-tamperable event that has happened, and it is being held by the holder. That's you with your wallet, your your digital wallet, and you can move around ecosystems with that wallet. So now all of a sudden, in this trust triangle, 
the holder becomes the person in the middle of the interaction, not um, not these uh, uh, identity providers. So you're now holding your information, your identity, and your claims. And so now when an uh, institution wants to say, hey, is this person um, or, or thing authorized to access this information, as a holder, you have um, claims that say, oh, I am, or I, this is true. You can pass it on and present it to the verifier. And the verifier can basically assert that it, they can verify the uh, these credentials and say, oh, this person has not been, this data has not been tampered with. It is cryptographically been signed saying this has not moved. And so we now know that this is actually a true statement and this was not a faulty statement. Um, when we think about it, uh, you'll see this box on the bottom called the verifiable data registry. In reality, there's a, a, another fourth layer, which is who's issuing that particular data. So if I, inform, uh, if I issue some information saying, my name is Bob, um, that's less inf informative than if the government issues that. So who we care about uh, issuing data is important. So there's this other sort of piece of this, which is, the authority of the issuance is 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 uh, a valuable information point for making a trust decision, and that's usually made by a governance authority of some sort, whether it's you and which we call it a self-certifying identifier, or it's another third party, which would be an existential uh, identifier, which is saying, "Hey, this this thing is happening, uh, or is issuing this credential, and basically this is all happening from a, a third body that's describing it." So that would be the government IDs, for example. So. This is what we call the trust diamond because now we have a, a fourth little bubble here describing governance authority. Um, we'll go into the details of each of these components, but before I think the mental model is really important, Encore and Kim actually as well, do you have any points you wanna make on this as well before we move on? No, nope, all good, um, unless there are questions. How many people have come across this trust diamond before? You haven't come across this one? Who who had no? Oh, was okay. this a question for the audience? <laughs> oh, yeah. I was like, wait, okay, yeah. Let's see. Great question. So, um, I'm not sure pronouncing uh, your name right, Shin Kwan. Um, centralized identity providers such as Octave tried to pivot pivot into the uh, DID space, but failed to make any inroads into monetization issues. What are the monetizations for DID PAP platforms nowadays? It's a really good question. There's a few of them that are, are surfacing, but it's definitely a very explored uh, topic still. Uh, one is, um, you know, you can charge on, uh, some pr uh, identity providers will charge on issuance. Some of them will charge on verifications, the amount of verifications that go through. You'll see things like uh, zero party ad data, for example. This is charging, for example, uh, holders can charge. Uh, so each of these actors have pivot points that they can actually make money on. Um, and for example, a holder has information on themselves that they may want to sell, right? A verifier may want to uh, pay an issuer um, in the case where a verifier is saying, oh, this data is valuable and I'm willing to pay you to get that, that data. And so they'll, they'll request it from the holder and, and it's possible that actually they split the, the value depending on where the issuer and the holder are in this process. So there's a few different models out there, um, but it's a, it's a great question because there's no... Um, there's no one right way yet. There, there's just a few different approaches and, and all of them work are, are, it's made a lot of movement since before. Um, I think uh, verification flows and charging on those seem to be one of the areas that seem to be um, having a little bit more promise, but um, yeah, there's there's a few different areas. Uh, Encore, Kim, do you have any thoughts on monetization as well? Yeah, no, I'd stress like, you know, like you said, there's no one size fits all. Sometimes the other model that I've seen in practice is it's adopted by an entire ecosystem and they care about the efficiency gains that happen across the ecosystem, which obviously you can't go and put a number to, um, but, the, but there might not be a direct cost or charge for every single atomic transaction. Um, I think what 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 is important is like you know the the ability to be flexible like you know depending on the industry and the use case that you're in yeah, yeah. and uh, let me make sure i'm unmuted yeah it's a good question um riley hughes from Trinsic has a 
article or blog post that will be coming out soon. And one thing that um, a, a trend that we keep coming back to is that uh, scale is key. So how do you bootstrap this to happen? So let me give some examples of that. Um, there are large identity providers. Um, I won't name them, but you know they've made movements in the did space in the past. But then um, and and make observations like you say. But then now they're coming back to it because when it comes to say scaling uh, governance frameworks, you just can't do it. And there are certain cases where decentralized identity, you just sort of need to allow the um, organic, you know, decentralized model uh, that enables scale. Uh, some other examples where we're seeing, um, you know, where I would maybe put my money on what's likely to move first would be, um, you know, industrial use cases, things like that, where, um, uh, what do you say, like um, the the traditional central authority models or, you know, anchoring in a, a CA certificate model just won't scale. You need that more, more flexibility. So that's one. It's, it's interesting and it shows that decentralized identity can apply to non-human entities. We're also very interested in the human specific use cases. And now the industrial ones do apply eventually to that. Some other ones include traveler uh, kinds of use cases where um, it just really forces the issue of all of your identity documents need to be carried from the uh, high stakes to the low stakes. And there are a few more that are really taking off, but it is, um, I think a lot of the early learnings from it do really emphasize that you need, you need scale. And so getting to that point is really about connecting with the right use cases, which then provides these other benefits. Yep, and I just uh, put one other comment here in the, in the chat, which is there are new channels that open up because once you have ecosystems that are interoperating across standards, new channels open up and that is paths toward monetization. You can, that's valuable because they're not open before. Um, so uh, yeah, all great, great points. Um, We'll go into building blocks. Um, maybe, uh, Encore, do you want to take this for a bit? And then, um, yeah, yeah, I can do this one and the next one. So the first kind of building block that you might have heard of is something called decentralized identifiers or DIDs. And the second kind of building block is verifiable credentials. But let's start with what are decentralized identifiers. Um, the closest analogy that I can take to it is, is, is a bit like a car's license plate or number plate. Like it's a unique identifier that allows you to reference to a particular person or company or subject that uh, the, the that the details are about. But it, in itself, it's not the full thing. So if you go on to the next slide, um, you have some form of address, which is the, in this example, you can see it as did colon example colon one, two, three, four, five, six, that might be a unique identifier for someone in particular or some company. Um, and then you have something associated with it, which is called a DID document. And that DID document is the thing that has the full details about it. Did example is not a real uh, did method as far as I'm aware. <laughs> I think somebody tried to do this at there, a conference. There, there is a did uh, WTF. I'll just <laughs> uh, did checked actually so so just so you know there's there's over 200 uh did yeah methods at this point there's and, over uh, 200 did methods and and that is partly the an example of that decentralization um the similar analogy that i take there is it should be a bit like hosting providers you've got hundreds and thousands of different kinds of hosting providers around the world who can provide you compute services and you can do it yourself. You can delegate the responsibility to somebody else. So there's uh, many, many different kinds of DID methods. They all follow um, some common rules. When I say DID method, what do I mean by that? Um, it's the bit that's after the colon. So when you look at something like DID colon web, there are specific rules about how do you go and write a DID colon web. Um, and it's typically published on a website. If you look at something like DID colon ether, that is an Ethereum-based 
mechanism. So that, that doesn't mean it necessarily needs to be written to some kind of decentralized or distributed storage or a blockchain though. Some people have that as a, a preconception, but like, you know, the actual target of it can be can be quite different. So for example, did colon DHT, which you see over here, uses a mechanism which is very similar to how uh, BitTorrent or torrents work. How do you resolve the details about a particular did with a unique identifier to the actual did document that describes things about that subject. Well, you can go through a couple of different rules. Every single did method will have their own unique and specific method of doing it. But the most common and consistent way that you might be able to do this is something called the universal resolver, which is an open source project that is um, sponsored and worked on by many, many different organizations within DIFF that you can go and try out yourself. Um, you'll see uh, many of the dozens of different DID methods that exist. And if you go click resolve, it allows you to go fetch the DID document. A lot yeah. of like, you know what this, uh, sorry, yes, go on. I was just gonna ask, you guys can see the uh, the re resolver, right? I just wanna make sure the screen is fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Go ahead, sorry. So, um, and what do you typically store in the documents? You typically store not the actual information that uh, which Andor will go on to a second when he describes verifiable credentials, but what do you typically store is uh, a stamp or, or a signature or public key that allows you to verify that some information is, is actually valid. The, the analogy that I take over here is Say you got a statement like a PDF or a piece of paper from your bank that says this is the amount of money that you have in your bank. Sometimes when you have to go and prove that to someone, what you do is you take it to your bank and they, they put an actual stamp on it. So it's a bit like you took a picture of what that stamp looks like and, and you publish that in, in a DID document. Because what it allows you to do is it allows anybody that you present a digital credential that has been issued by that bank or issued by that entity to go and check, does the signature or the stamp match what I would expect to come from this particular uh, bank or company or organization? Um, and so that's where it, it becomes quite powerful and quite interesting because you, you don't fall back to the same challenges that you have when you're looking at centralized systems or federated systems where access to that sort of information can be quite controlled. I'll pause there for any questions or comments. And if not, then I hand over back to Andor to tell us about how um, I'm working on a DID method, but haven't integrated it with the universal resolver. That's an excellent question. So um, if you have a DID method that you've written, um, and same as like, you know, the 150 people who've written DID methods, you don't have to use this specific website. Um, typically what you do is you write a small piece of software called a driver for that particular DID method. And what that driver allows you to do is it will have the logic for that specific did method on how can you fetch it from wherever that is stored and, and present it back as, as JSON. Um, so you don't have to use the specific website called dev.uniresolver.io. Um, this particular repository, it has a Docker Compose file, which if you do like Docker Compose up, that brings up the entire system. Now you can actually pick and choose because there's about, I think, hundreds of hundreds of different drivers in there. If you're not actually resolving to every single one of them, you can turn off the ones that you don't require and you can just run that service yourself. So in practice, a lot of companies run their own instance of the universal resolver that might actually be able to handle production level loads. And if you go in over here, you can see um, all of those different drivers being mentioned. See, there's a comment here. Awesome. Okay. Um, Back to you on these. Yep. Okay. So the other big building block is verified credentials or verifiable. Sorry. And um, 
I think the the basic there's a lot of different types of formats, and you might hear it, but I think that the the, the saying I like was uh, actually Timothy Ruff. I, I saw this from last. Uh, I pulled this from last year's presentation. Verify credentials are shipping containers for data. They're essentially built on three layers. Uh, you have a metadata field, basically, and that has information about the credential itself, the actual claims, which are the actual representations being made, and then the proof, which is um, the cryptographic signing uh, that this credential is, is valid. And um, there's a whole, you'll, you'll see a lot of the debates in the uh, decentralized identity community around which formats to use and so forth. In fact, Open Wallet has a nice little comparison chart. I'm just going to share over here. If you want to check out formats, oops, that's the wrong link. Um, so you can take a look at, here's the many, many types of, of credential types. But in general, there's a few that are more um, commonly converged against. Um, so I would, uh, um, and the verified credential data model is this abstract form of that model that, that people are, are using a lot. Um, and so that's kind of to the right. When you request these credentials, and you can see a little bit more detail here, um, the, the credential will have a subject and claims, for example, Pat is an alumni example university. And this is basically the, a little bit more of a clear structure on what that looks like. If you see the JSON here, you'll see um, that's what that verified credential looks like. And it's using JSON all D contexts. And that's generally what you're going to be using for most VCs. But how do you get this credential moving between parties? So now, uh, let's say in the, in the most simple case, which we're talking about, like, let's say government IDs. The government issues an identifier to you saying, hey, you're a person, and you now have this on your wallet. Well, how do you share that with somebody that's saying, is this person, for example, over 18? Well, there's this thing called presentation exchange. Uh, the presentation exchange is basically a, a way where a verifier, somebody that wants information about what the credentials a holder is holding can request information from the holder saying, please show that you're over 18, for example. The holder then can prepare a presentation back to the verifier uh, submitting, I am over 18 and here's my proof why. Now, because this is all cryptographically signed and done in a way where um, you can prove it out, uh, the verifier knows that the holder didn't make it up and that it was issued by the government. There's a little piece here where the verifier has to know that it was issued um, by the government itself. So that's where we have registries to know that the government was the issuer. Um, but the, that's the basic flow is basically verifier will ask, please show me, for example, you're over 18. Holder will send back a submission saying, I'm over 18 and here's my proof. Verifier will say, oh, I know that this is a government issued ID and, and that this is uh, been non-tampered. And so we're good to go and you'll get a green check, for example, in the case of a, of, of, of a bar. Um, there's cases where maybe you only want to share little pieces of information. Um, for example, when you guys go to the, to the bars, for example, um, and somebody asks you for your ID and it says, are you over 21? They get to look at everything that you have on your car, your card. So they'll see your, your, uh, address. They'll see, you know, your gender, your date of birth, all that stuff. And you really just need to show them, am I over 18? That's really the, the question that you need to solve. So there's this thing called selective disclosure and, and ZKPs, right, which allow you to show either less data or uh, completely uh, no data except for the fact that are you over 18 or not? Because fundamentally, the question that you need to answer is, are you are you over 18 or 21, depending on your country, um, not uh, where are you living right now? Um, Encore, do you have anything you want to add to this slide? I, I know this was a red slide. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, so I think one of the key aspects here is this isn't by default in every single credential format. Um, you have to use one of the specific credential formats that uh, support a level of selective disclosure or zero knowledge. Um, and it, it sort of like, you know, comes in two flavors. The first is that very common example of is your age above 18 or not? That's a numerical question, and it's easy to encode as a numerical question. Um, some of the credential types uh, can very easily support questions of that kind. The other kind of selective disclosure is something that cannot be encoded as a numerical question. So for example, show me the first line of your address without showing the second, third, or the fourth line of your address. 
where it is textual information, um, where what you're actually trying to do is just to redact some of the information from being presented in a digital credential that you already have um, and not necessarily trying to answer is a number below or above a certain range uh, as, as, as a factor. So you have to, if you want to use selective disclosure, use one of the uh, specific formats that allow it and, and consider whether like your, which, which one of those types of selective disclosure or zero knowledge proof does your particular use case require. Um, here's another example. Um, so if you use, uh, for example, um, OpenID as a way to, to do identity, uh, there's an OpenID um, SD jots, which are um, uh, selective disclosure uh, JSON web tokens. And you can see here, here's an example that the selective disclosure works, which is basically you get issued a, um, a verified credential with many different types of claims in it. And then you can basically provide uh, only the subset of salts that are required to uh, decrypt those claims. So you send the whole credential over, but only some of it is actually visible by the verifier. And that's another way to do it. That's kind of going back to the earlier point that this is another way where you're sending actually all the data over, but only some of it is readable. And so for, for the purposes of privacy, you can actually just send over, for example, one field like this is my address. It's just one way. Um, there's lots of other ways to do it as well. Um, this is probably one of the more simple ways to do that, though, because it's just uh, conceptually easier to understand than some of the other um, ZKP methods. Um, that's the, the basics in a nutshell. I think the plan would be, unless there's questions, we can go through some of the existing old projects and run a little interactive session um, just to, to see where people have gone with these projects in the past, what are some of the technologies that they've done, they've used, and learn from them and see, uh, hopefully that inspires y'all to, to go build your own solutions as well. Um, before we move on, any questions for Ankur, myself, Kim, on the basics and uh, before we move on to, to these projects? Okay, so we'll we'll launch into the projects. This was last year's um, hackathon, so we'll start off with uh, we'll just run through it. If any of them are particularly interesting for you, please feel free to uh, to um, well, you can stop on those and just mention in the chat. These are interesting. We'll stop on it. Uh, the decentralized linked uh, was a, a decentralized LinkedIn version using uh, Web five and TBD stack. Um, so this was uh, basically, and you can see this is how these uh, these hackathon submissions were were provided. Um, it used what's called a DWN, which is a decentralized web node. It's a storage mechanism for providing a very similar flow to what you get in a traditional LinkedIn, right? So you can post jobs um, and view job applications. It's all encrypted, and um, you know you were able to run it in the browser, for example, and so that's. Uh, this project here, and uh, this one won. Um, it was one of the winners, uh, first place, um, and it was a really well done project. The presentation was really nice. So those of you that want to get a good example of, you know, what your project should look like, um, this is not a, a bad one to look at as a starting point to just kind of see like what was inspired. Um, any questions on this one, or we can move on. You can see here. Uh, he has a job listing, and this is the, the simple decentralized LinkedIn version, right? So he's listed jobs, and he has companies, and uh, they're able to, uh, again, all of this is over a decentralized web node. So that's how he built this app. And each of the, uh, the uh, job listings are uh, signed objects, so they're non-tamperable. You can't make up a job later. And then decentralized web nodes are um, synchronized across uh, browser and phone. So you'd have it on your local device as well as on the browser using your own keys. Uh, one update on this as well, um, TBD, uh, TBD, Diff, and Google partnered together uh, recently. And so there's free decentralized web node hosting with Google for those of you that want to use it as part of your project. Um, this one here, um, it, anonymous door unlocking capability. So they actually built hardware. This is a really cool project. I got a chance to, to look at this one when it, was, when it came through. Um, but you can see here, they actually not only built software, 
they they uh, actually lined it up with um, the hardware to open up doors. Um, and so that was a, a cool little project where they were using a, um, BBS. So they were using uh, a selective uh, a privacy forward method mechanism for um, basically allowing you to to share minimal information. Uh, and also open up a door to see if you can enter it into a building or not. Um, so that was also another really cool project. Um, so this was, um, yeah, this was uh, fun to see because I think the Japan winner came over to IAW um, last year and was able to actually visit off of uh, his win. There's that one. Any of these interesting? There's some HealthX protocol, Trustbox. There's a Web5 uh uh, email. So you can think about your email being completely decentralized and uh, encrypted with your stuff and easier to migrate across servers. Um, yeah, I think, uh, and a lot of them are in the medical field as well. So you can think about moving data records across uh, ecosystems. That was something that a lot of people were really interested in. Um, so as a holder, you're moving uh, your your information about, you know, your your medical history and so forth to your doctors and uh, wanting to be able to have it in a way where you don't have to worry about logging into a portal to somebody else's website and then not have it interoperate with other web providers or, or, or uh, hospital providers. Um, any one of these particularly interesting? Let's see if there's anyone in the chat. Yeah, link to the last year's gallery. Encore, anyone that you want to call out? Is there anything that, uh, you know, we should be calling out that there's a lot of projects, really cool projects. Um, I like Mail Five, which was the the web app. Yeah. I think there's a um, one of the um, hackathon sponsors actually, Vidos or Mailchain, are doing something very similar. It's building in a mechanism to uh, prove or sign using your decentralized identifiers. Um, when when emailing someone because i often see the act of exchanging a digital credential very much as the act of sending an email in a sense and and an email address is is sort of exactly like an identifier a decentralized identifier anybody getting inspired by this any thoughts you can see here just run through this there were a few medical ones as well, like quite a few, and those are really interesting. Um, of course, in medical area it tends to be highly regulated and everything, but it really stands out as an area where um, identity matching that they try to do, like say if you're at a hospital or something is really hard and it makes all the difference for the split second decisions. So um, I really like to see innovation in that area. A lot of people were building on decentralized web nodes from the TBD stack. Um, just, you know, there, there's sort of the blend between when you're using a wallet and when sort of a decentralized web node type storage makes sense, maybe too much to get into in this session. But I think uh, decentralized web nodes, people are finding that makes a lot of sense. Oops. All right, I think we can just open for questions. We have 10 minutes left. Um, I'm happy to, we can go through any of these in like detail if you guys want. Um, I think what would be helpful is if anybody has any particular project that is interesting to them and they'd like to learn more, we're happy to describe that. If anybody has any technology that they want to dive into more, we're also happy to do that. Um, there's a number of uh, core technologies you might want to look into. Uh, some of them host at diff, for example, uh, didcom is another one that you might want to be aware of. So you have DWNs, you also have didcom for messaging. Um, those are two, two, two sort of specifications that live at diff right now. So you can see this one's an Aries. Uh, that's this is didcom, um, an Aries uh, uh, wallet basically with DWN. So they did both. I think this was the linking one. Let's see. Any comments, questions, interesting projects? things that people would like to uh, get inspired with or any ideas coming out from some of these projects. Museum passes, crypto trading platform. 
again, a lot of an interesting submission about title transfer too. I think it was, I think it was Polygon ID, but I think I just thought the use case was so interesting. How there's this gap when people, um, I guess, when you're trying to buy a used car, there's like a title transfer that has to happen, and there's this like really long gap that's like two months that they were able to kind of like get down to a few days um, with this use case. Um, I'd have to pull up. I'll pull it up, <laughs> and then I can put the put it in the chat. It's a decentralized DNS while we're waiting. Um, Ankur, any any? Uh, I think you had a. Wasn't there um some interactive thing that we might do or? I didn't prep one. <laughs> okay, then we're good. Uh, yeah, I think I think we can just dive into if anybody wants to pull into the other uh, any of these any questions or any projects that you want to explore we're happy to do it otherwise I think that was the main content you can give the... people some time back in their diaries and I think obviously it's a lot to take in um, feel free to join us on the Discord where you can ask follow up questions as you actually start exploring a lot of this you you might um, be able to see clarifications and. Uh, yeah, like, you know, I mean, I think there's the, the, the main thing I'd say is uh, decentralized identities genuinely, like Andor said, not just for people. So you can you can be quite open into like, is it about things? Is it about objects? Is it about content? Is it about companies? Um, it's it's very broad that you can actually try out many, many different ideas. I'm going to send over, um, GP is asking, how do we connect? I'm going to send over the Diff Hackathon Discord um, for more specific uh, hackathon related um, white people. And then I'm also going to send over, if you want outside of the hackathon, uh, the labs um, discussion. Um, that's always a, a cool spot to just talk to people if you want. Um, we're just starting up this uh, Discord server, so welcome to join in as well. Oh, I just found it. It was called Title Blocks. If anyone's interested in checking it out, I'll just drop it in the chat as well. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot of really cool projects. And uh, um, some of the projects i will say like it's not always about the tech sometimes it's about the concept or idea or the position so you might implement something that's usually using a very standard flow nothing too crazy on the tech side but the take on on to uh, lamari's point the fact that it's you know for example titles we weren't thinking about titles before very little people talked about titles and so that was like a really interesting um use case and so um, I'd encourage those that aren't uh, as familiar with the decentralized identity space or um, necessarily with the tech to think about what are some interesting applications and start with that as a problem statement and then reach out to the community um, to learn more about what tech they can use to solve those problems. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's awesome. I think Lamar just and said this is just advice from having done other hackathons. Um, you can often apply to multiple challenges or submissions. Lamari, that is allowed, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, you can submit, but as long as um, you meet the requirements of that sponsor. Yeah, yeah, as long as you meet the requirements of that. But that's a fantastic like way. You, you might have built a certain product, but if you think about what the pitch is, as long as you meet the requirements, you might be able to construct something that uh, meets the submission criteria for multiple challenges and and that sort of could be quite an interesting way of like you know participating in in multiple challenges awesome i think we have five minutes back everybody good luck with your hackathon um feel free to uh reach out again and um best of luck and thank you encore uh, for I asked him to participate and help out, and uh, he was grateful enough, or uh, he was uh, um, gracious enough to to offer his time to to help out with this uh, presentation as well. So thank you. Thank you for pulling her. together the whole thing in the first place, <laughs> and Kim and Lamari for inviting us. Um, so thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of the great. the weekend, and good luck hacking.
Thank you. Bye, everyone.